Hi, I'm David Levine. I'm co-chair of Science Writers in New York. Joe Bonner is invisible, but he's in the background running this and recording it for YouTube. My guest tonight is Dr. Stephanie Strathby. She's an infectious disease epide epidemiologist, associate dean of global health science and Harold Simon Professor of Medicine at the University of California, San Diego, where she now co-directs a center for innovative phage applications and therapeutics called IPATH. In 2016, she and her colleagues were credited with saving her husband's life from a deadly superbug infection using bacteriophages, viruses that attack bacteria. The case, which involved cooperation with three universities, the United States Navy and researchers across the globe, show how this therapy is a future weapon against multi-drug resistant bacterial infections, which are expected to kill 10 million people per year by 2050. She and her husband co-authored a book on their story called The Perfect Predator, a scientist's race to save her husband from a deadly superbug. So uh, Dr. Strathby, welcome. Thanks very much, uh, David. First of all, tell us, tell people what's, I mean, most people know what MRSA is. What is it? So what is, what is a superbug? Well, a superbug is a bacteria that's resistant to multiple antibiotics. MRSA is short for methicillin resistant staph aureus. And that was the first superbug to be discovered in 1961. And since then it's gone global and so have a bunch of other ones. Okay. So, and I think we said that If we don't get better treatments, there's going to be 10 million people will die by the year 10,050, and already 150,000 people die in the United States each year. Um, that's right. And that's 10 million per year, by the way. That's one person every three seconds. Uh, that estimate comes from the World Health Organization and the UN, and uh, it's believed to be an underestimate, and it's gotten worse under COVID. Okay. So what are the superbugs are there? And then tell us your story of how you saved your husband. We must be very grateful to you all the time. <laughs> well, it was a global village. Um, yeah. And uh, I, you know, I, I came up with the idea of how to do it, but um, I really needed um, a lot of help. So um, I'm just grateful because it was really, um, you know, total strangers that stepped up to the plate. Um, but you're right, um, superbugs um, are a global problem. It isn't just a problem in the United States or in developing countries. Um, it's um, um, really a product of our overuse and misuse of antibiotics. Most people, including myself, uh, several years ago when this story happened, I didn't realize that many countries, including the US, 70% of antibiotics are actually used in livestock, not for medical use in people. And their use in livestock is to make animals grow fatter faster. So it's really about agribusiness. And that lobby has made it difficult for um, several governments to cut down the use of antibiotics. And so this uh, problem is ever expanding. And with global warming and um, you know, climate change, um, the, the situation is getting worse. And under COVID, with a lot of people being in the hospital, on ventilators, um, they're more exposed to superbugs. So we've had a number of uh, superbug outbreaks in the United States um, since COVID began with the same superbug my husband had, and we've been able to use the same treatment um, to save them. So let's hear the story about your husband. I mean, he, first of all, he, you were in Egypt and he felt ill and you were exploring caves and the person told you don't breathe the air, but that really wasn't the cause. Of it, was it? No, not at all. Um, so my husband and I are, are scientists. Um, we're both based at the University of California, San Diego, and um, we go to conferences and tack on a few personal days. And um, he'd always wanted to go to Egypt. And so Thanksgiving, um, uh, U.S. style um, holiday in Egypt was really about having a good time and, and you know, seeing King Tut's tomb and uh, we, we were having a lovely um, time on this cruise ship. In fact, we were the only ones on the ship because uh, 
they're literally the only ones on the ship other than the crew because there'd been a terrorist attack in Sharm el Sheikh um, a, a couple of weeks prior. And my husband said, oh, it's a perfect time to go. Nobody else will be there. Well, I wish in retrospect that we had kind of skipped it because he would have ended up sick, but not with the superbug. We know now um, that the superbug that he acquired was an Egyptian stream. Um, so what happened was he, he had a gallstone attack um, and um, we didn't really know what was going on. He, he was vomiting and, and just like really ill and um, called a doctor to the ship. And the doctor um, eventually said, look, um, he's going into shock. We need to get him to the closest clinic. There was no hospital in Luxor where the ship was based. Um, and the doctors um, and the nursing staff did the best that they could. Um, but they didn't have um, a lot of the resources that we have in the U.S. and, and in Western Europe. So um, they helped stabilize him. And he was medevaced first to Germany and then back home to the United States um, right before Christmas of, of 2015. So um, by that time, um, the Germans had identified that he had a giant abscess the size of a small football in his abdomen. And in that had, had moved um, a superbug that made, made a nice little apartment in there. And it wasn't just any superbug. It was um, its nickname is actually Arachobacter because so many veterans have come back from the Middle East with the same superbug and um, it was became resistant to all antibiotics in a very short period of time so by the time we got him home to san diego where my colleagues in my own department were caring for him i thought wow we're you know modern medicine can take care of this it's going to be no problem and they said look um you know he's too weak for surgery and we're going to have to poke holes in his abdomen and put these drains in there and hope that that'll kind of siphon off all this infected fluid because the last thing we want is for that superbug to get out of this abscess out of that apartment in his abdomen um, because he'll go in, into septic shock and we don't have any antibiotics to to fight it anymore well and unfortunately there, and there's that's also, what happened and there was also fear of spreading it's being spread within the hospital too oh yes there was there was fear about that but we were um in infection control and in the icu and you know gowns and gloves and you know the whole ppe that people are familiar with now um, this particular superbug is really only a problem for people with weakened immune systems or um, who have suffered a trauma. So that's why, for example, um, people coming back from, you know, the wars in, in the Middle East or in Afghanistan who'd had shrapnel in their wounds, um, this um, superbug is common in soil. So it would infect those, those wounds and several thousand U.S. troops actually survived their injuries, but died from Arachobacter. So this was a nasty one we were up against. But I, I still understand, it's, it's, it's not, it's not, is it contagious from, within, from a person who has it in the hospital? Yeah, it's contagious, all right. But it's just that like a, a, a healthy person like me wasn't at risk of acquiring disease from it because my immune system was robust. He was in a weakened state because he had this abscess in his abdomen. And of course, what happened is it kept spreading. So the drains that the doctors used uh, um, in San Diego to try to siphon off this infected fluid, one of those slipped and poured all that infected fluid into his abdomen, into his bloodstream, and he went into septic shock right in front of my eyes. And from that moment on, he was fully colonized with this superbug, and he was dying a little bit each day. It was absolutely horrible. And he's also hallucinating and had delirium. Yeah, um, you know, when you're in the ICU, even if you don't have a superbug, you often experience what's called ICU psychosis, or it's a form of delirium, where, um, you know, he says it's not quite like an acid trip, where you think of, a, you know, really a cartoon type thing, it's, it really feels real, it, it's a part of him. And so he had these hallucinations where he was wandering in the desert. Um, and they're very kind of almost biblical in, in, the, in their description. Others where, you know, he's in a swamp, he thought he was a snake. Um, when, so when I asked him if he wanted to live and to squeeze my hand, if he wanted to live, he actually literally at that moment thought that he was a snake. And it took him several minutes to figure out how to wrap himself around my hand to squeeze it. And of course, I didn't know this because he was on a ventilator. It was several months later when he recovered that he was able to tell me this. And, and so that's when we decided to write our book because we realized we'd gone through the same ordeal, but we had different experiences. And we also 
uncovered a hundred year old forgotten cure that saved his life and is now being upheld as a potential solution to the superbug crisis. Okay, so why don't you tell us what phage therapy is? Well, and how, and how'd you come up with the idea? Well, I have a rusty old degree in microbiology from the University of Toronto. I'm not a medical doctor and I'm certainly not a microbiologist, but I had heard of bacteriophage. Um, and that word comes from the Greek phagine, uh, I think, uh, if I'm not mm -hmm. mispronouncing it, um, it means to eat. And it, so the word means literally bacteria eater. And um, phage were discovered um, in uh, around 1915, 1917, depending on who you ask. But it wasn't until 1917 that a, a French Canadian microbiologist named Felix de Harel deduced that um, what he was looking at um, must be smaller than bacteria because it passed through a Pasteur filter, which um, screens out bacterial particles. And that um, um, supernatant was able to kill bacteria um, in, in, that were taken from patients that were dying of dysentery. And so he was able to say, okay, so if it's smaller than bacteria and it's killing bacteria, it must be a parasite of bacteria. I, uh, therefore, I think it's a virus of bacteria. And even though he wasn't proven right until the 1940s when the electron microscope was developed, um, he called this um, bacteriophage. And um, so bacteriophage were actually used to treat bacterial infections in the 1920s and 30s. This is before penicillin came on the scene as the first antibiotic. And um, it, you know, had, had something of a heyday. He was actually the inspiration for the book Aerosmith that um, Sinclair um, wrote um, and um, won the uh, Pulitzer Prize back in the 1920s. So, um, but of course, penicillin was a wonder drug and it was brought to market in the early 1940s around the time of World War II and phage therapy was relegated to the back burner, except in places like the former Soviet Union where it was hard to obtain. And so in um, the Republic of Georgia and in Poland, phage therapy has existed for decades, but in the United States and in Western Europe and in Canada, it's really not been used at all. And it's only our urgency of dealing with the superbug crisis that um, is being considered at all. So um, I actually went and did research on my own when my husband uh, squeezed my hand and said in his own way that he wanted to live. And I hit the internet and used PubMed, um, the National Library of Medicine's uh, search engine to find um, publications that could have alternative treatments. And one of them mentioned phage therapy. And I was able to convince the doctors that were treating him, who were my colleagues, that um, to give it a try. But the problem was we had to find phages that were a specific match for his bacteria, because it isn't just like any phage will attack any bacteria. So that was the next ch challenge. And how is, how is it, is it, is it, is it a pill that's administered? Is that, how is it administered? Uh, it depends on, on um, the infection. In our case, because uh, Tom was fully colonized with this um, superbug, that the decision was to treat him intravenously um, with what amounted to a billion phages per dose every two hours. So the fear was that this could kill him, but he was going to die anyway. In fact, I signed the consent form for kidney dialysis the day that we started phage therapy. And uh, he, he was thought to be within a couple hours of, of dying. And yet uh, a couple of days after phage therapy began, he lifted his head off the pillow, uh, awoke from a deep coma and kissed his daughter's hand who was in, standing in front of him. So everybody in the ICU freaked out, including myself. And um, the rest is history. Um, he made um, a near complete recovery and other people have gone on to receive phage therapy as a direct result of this. We've opened the first dedicated phage therapy center in North America, IPATH at UC San Diego, other phage therapy centers at the Mayo Clinic um, and uh, Baylor, um, Yale University um, have, have opened up and, um, and now phage therapy is going through clinical trials sponsored by the NIH. So there's great hope that we can use phage therapy to treat bacterial infections that have become increasingly resistant um, to antibiotics. So, you know, before we chatted, you know, before we started, and these are not, these are like the, the vaccines. They're not approved by the, they're not approved by the it's FDA. experimental in the U.S., that's right. So how'd you get them? 
Well, when you have an experimental treatment, um, you need to um, have it approved by the FDA, the Food and Drug Administration. And so um, my colleague, Dr. Chip Schooley, who oversaw the phage therapy protocol for my husband, contacted the FDA after we were able to find phages that matched, which is a whole other story okay. that's detailed in the book, um, and um, explained what we were trying to do. And the FDA official knew all about phage therapy. In fact, she said, you know, we've been hoping for a case like this. Um, you know, to be honest, somebody who was dying of family members was willing to try phage therapy, um, an institution that was willing to cut through the red tape, a doctor that was willing to take the risk and a phage community that was willing to source phages in time to save their life. And yes, we'll give you approval and please document the case so that it will help others. And now that office in the, uh, in the FTA handles a lot more phage therapy requests as a result of us. Well, so many, okay, so if you want to have a question, put it in the Q&A box, um, please, not the chat. And someone has a question. How do you know the appropriate dose? Well, you don't. Actually, we still don't know what the appropriate dose is, but based on uh, clinical experience um, with, um, and also backed up with people who've been doing this in, in the Republic of Georgia and in Poland, it's worse to underdose because then the phage, which are identified by the human immune system as an invader, can be eliminated and they won't reach their target. And we um, have had enough experience with phage therapy that um, it's not harmful to the body um, that, that, you know, Tom didn't undergo septic shock, even though we gave him a billion phages per dose. Um, and so um, the phage that are left over that don't reach their target are actually eliminated mostly by the liver and the spleen. And so um, we need to do um, clinical trials with dosing regimens to figure out what the appropriate dose is. So those are, are going to be underway um, later this year. So someone asked, how do you identify a phage that is specific for a given bug? That's a good question. Okay, well, it's actually kind of the- That's a doctor asking. Okay, the, the, okay well, the, the crazy part of this story um, is that um, where do you find phage and how do you identify them? Well, you find phage are thought to be the most um, populous organism on the planet. They're also among the oldest. There's um, estimated to be 10 million trillion trillion phages on the planet. So they're everywhere. But a great place to find them, especially if you have um, a superbug that's in your gut, is in sewage because there's a lot of bacteria. Wherever there is a lot of bacteria, you find the perfect predator to fight them. So literally phage were sourced um, from my, for my husband from barnyard waste and sewage samples from um, sewage um, and water treatment facilities. And what you do is you have a Petri dish and you streak it with the bacteria that you want to kill. And you put a drop of sewage um, on the plate and um, you incubate it for 24 to 48 hours. And if it comes back looking like Swiss cheese, even though you can't see the phage, right? They're hundred times smaller than bacteria. Um, you know that they've been at work because they've gobbled up that bacterial colony. So there's like literally like halos in the, the Petri dish. So you get excited because you've got a phage that's gonna kill the bacteria. You pluck that out and you add more bacterial suspension to grow it up. So you just let nature do its work. I mean, the bacteria and the phage have been, you know, fighting each other for almost 4 billion years. And then you have the problem where you've got to purify the phage um, uh, cocktail uh, because all this debris from the bacteria, um, which um, amounts to what's called endotoxin from the lipopolysaccharide layer of the uh, bacterial cell wall. That can be toxic. So that was the only thing that, that we were really concerned about and that the FDA was said, okay, we need you to ha have this endotoxin at the lowest possible limit if you're going to inject it into people. But that's essentially how you identify phage. So you might you know, have a well that has 96 like little Petri, um, you know, holes in there instead of just one but um my tedx talk shows you the whole process okay um so we're gonna i'm, I'm gonna take a few more questions and i want to actually to, we'll talk about antibiotic resistance and why <clears throat> why it got why it got so bad um so um how long would it take to get approval when you apply for this well, in my husband's case, we applied for FDA approval once we knew that we had um, a phage cocktail that matched. And um, 
the um, uh, FDA official said, look, if, he, if it looks like he's going to die imminently, you can give it to him right away. But we'd like to see you remove as much endotoxin as possible. So that took um, several more days. And in the meantime, she connected us to the US Navy, who was also doing phage research. And they um, agreed to find a cocktail for him as well, because you want to have as, as many different phage as possible that will attack the bacteria, ideally attacking different receptors. But we didn't have the time to sequence the phage, so we didn't really know what we were doing. So um, these days, um, the patients that we put in requests for, we can get um, FDA approval within 24 hours. Good. Someone asked, and I don't no idea, um, have you worked with the Eliava Institute in Sibley? Or with the Sibley, yes. Oh, um, or with the, the, the company Introtech? Intro, intro so. Well, the Eliava Phage Therapy Center is um, the oldest. Um, that was established in the 1930s. Um, and um, Georgie Eliava, who was a Georgian, um, set it up with Felix de Harel, who was the discoverer of phage. And um, they have the most clinical experience by far. Um, I was obviously in a hurry to try to find phage to um, cure my husband. So the initial search that I took was I restricted to the U.S. because I didn't think we could get phage from anywhere overseas in time. But um, ultimately, the phage researchers that, that answered my call from Texas A&M University reached out overseas. And one of the researchers that offered expertise was Maya Mirabshvili, who was trained at the Ilyava Institute and is now um, working with the Phage um, Institute in Brussels. So um, they um, were very helpful and Maya um, ad advised on the dosing um, that, that she had um, thought um, and how to put the phage in through the catheters or the drains in his abdomen. So um, we have been in touch with them. Um, their phage preparations aren't approved by the FDA because they're not at the standards where they can actually remove the endotoxin level and sequence the phage, but they they have uh, really um, helped a lot of people over the years. Okay. Um, so, so right now you you have you're sick, you're not getting pneumonia. You're going to be prescribed. You're going to be prescribed an antibiotic. I mean, in the countries that are using phage therapy, do, do, you know, they use them. You said that they were used before the before when there were no antibiotics. They they were used to treat bacterial infections. That's right. Yeah, um, the Ilyava. It wasn't called the Ilyava Institute at the time, but it it opened, I believe, in 1936 or 1937. So it's, it's like phage therapy in the West was really forgotten. Um, we have a lot to learn from the clinical experience of our colleagues in the former Soviet Union. And part of the reason why it was forgotten is that during World War II, you know, Russia was an enemy. So phage therapy, because it was enthusiastically um, taken up there, it got the label as Pinko Kami science. And um, the biographer of Felix de Harel, uh, Bill Summers from Yale University has documented this very carefully. He has written a book on it. Um, I'd highly recommend it. It's um, fascinating to think that, you know, um, our own scientific and medical establishment have their own implicit biases. Um, and that certainly cast a pall over phage therapy for decades. Okay. So, okay, so some questions. Um, okay, do the phages have different potencies? Are they associated with known? I don't know, okay. Um, well, certain phage um, are going to be more potent than others. Um, that's part of what we need to do in terms of translational studies. Um, certain mm -hmm. phage will be better killers than others. There are um, some phage that are called temperate phages that um, in the book I call them sleepy phages because they enter the bacterial cell and instead of undergoing the phage rage kind of um, activity that you want, um, which kills the bacterial cell after copying itself, you know, hundreds of times and those phages go on to attack other phages. These sleepy phages or temperate phages, they integrate into the bacterial cells DNA and hit the snooze button. And we don't want that because they don't kill the bacterial cell, but they can also carry antimicrobial resistance genes or toxin genes. And there's even some recent research that shows that they can collude 
with the bacterial cell to make the bacterial cell resistant to attack from other phages. So for all those reasons, we don't wanna use those phages. So um, in some cases though, we can only find temperate phages that will, and, and, and not lytic phages. So for example, for Borrelia, which causes Lyme disease or for um, mycobacterium infections um, that are associated with TB or um, MAC, um, those um, types of phages are not ideal. So the genetic engineering has been used to clip out the repressor gene to force those phages to be lytic, the phage rage kind. And the first successful genetically modified phage cocktail was used to treat a young girl with cystic fibrosis who had a superbug infection. And um, it was published in um, 2019. So that's opened up this whole biotech industry where people are excited because it's very hard to patent natural, um, you know, organisms. So, but if you can genetically modify them or synthesize phage, then it's, it's more lucrative um, for biotech. So um, many um, biotechs have sprung up working in this space. Um, phage are also being used to groom the microbiome. I saw a question in the chat about that. Um, so that you can perhaps use phage to clear out bacteria that are causing dysbiosis or irritable bowel syndrome, or even associated with Crohn's disease. So there's companies that are working on that too. So it's a very exciting field right now. Um, someone asked, can you use phage <coughs> fungus? Well, um, phage <laughs> are specific to bacteria. So ba okay. bacteria phage attack bacteria, but there are um, mycophage um, that exist. I don't know too much about them, um, but there are, uh, viruses that will attack fungi, but they're not bacteriophage. Okay, now, and the last question I'll tell you, what are there side effects of phage therapy? We haven't found any side effects of phage therapy in the cases that we've treated at IPATH. Um, and, um, but, you know, it's possible that if you are using temperate phages that they could <laughs> um, carry these antimicrobial resistance genes or toxin genes. So either you want to cleave those genes out or not use those phages so, um, you know, at this point that, that using them is an open question, certainly the safety profile of genetically engineered phage and synthetic phages will need to be examined before those are rolled out. Uh, but first we need to do the clinical trials to examine natural phage in cocktails and we're building phage libraries to be able to match phage um, to bacterial isolates more quickly, because that's one of the biggest problems right now. I've literally gone to Twitter to crowdsource phages from different labs. <laughs> okay. Um, are, they, are they being, you know, usually with FDA, you have to do animal studies to get a drug approved? Will that be done? The FDA are not requiring animal studies in phage. They've seen the okay. safety profile um, and okay. are convinced that from my husband's case and others, that were, you know, people who were dying, that there was no resort um, and there was no side effects. So they're not requiring animal studies, which is terrific. So the, the countries like Russia and Poland where they're using it, why aren't we, why aren't they offering it to us? Um, well, they actually have been very helpful in offering it to us, but their, their phage preparations don't meet the FDA standards because they aren't able to remove the endotoxin or to sequence the phages to be able to examine whether or not they're, you know, temperate phages or not. So uh, because phage are so plentiful and easily found in nature, uh, we don't have to rely on, you know, reaching out to anybody. We can source them ourselves, but um, we are trying to network across the globe to identify phages that people would put into a giant repository. Um, and hopefully um, we'll be successful in doing that because it will benefit everybody. So let's go back to your husband's case. Um, I imagine they tried antibiotics for him. Yeah, but it was resistant to all antibiotics. I mean, right off the top, it was resistant to 15 different antibiotics and it acquired okay. resistance to the rest. So that was the problem. That was the only reason why the FDA would approve phage therapy because there was no antibiotic options left. So how do they, enter, I mean, I know, you know, you know, doctors now are not prescribing antibiotics as often, but it, they, you know, but how do they hope, how did the whole antibiotic problem start? And the, multi, and the nurses and the resistance, antibiotic yeah, well, well, resistance is actually, you know, part of nature. Um, it's, it's like um, survival of the fittest. So the bacteria will, um, you know, have mutations and those that evade um, either phage or antibiotics are the ones that live. 
It's just that, that unfortunately, that the misuse and overuse of antibiotics, and mostly in livestock, as I mentioned earlier, um, has selected for bacteria that are resistant to multiple antibiotics. And so we've got um, you know, people that don't use antibiotics properly, yes, that's a problem. Either they don't finish taking their antibiotics or they're taking antibiotics for a viral infection when that, that's not appropriate. Antibiotics only work against bacterial infections. But we've also got pharmaceutical companies and their effluent going into the environment. And um, just today, there was a report from China where it was found that microplastics um, that were contaminating um, Chinese rivers uh, promoted antimicrobial resistance because the um, the antimicrobial resistance genes can adhere to those microplastics. So, so the problem of climate change and environmental pollution and, and super, the superbug crisis are really converging, and we're going to see more of this. I mean, literally, um, the leaders of the CDC and WHO and UN are saying, we're entering an era where like a simple scrape or a minor surgery could result in somebody who has an infection that is no longer treatable and used to be treatable a couple of decades ago. So uh, it's a post antibiotic era, just like the pre antibiotic era where, you know, my um, great grandmother died of appendicitis because, you know, there was no penicillin available. I mean, we're, we're, we're really entering that again. It's a, it's a very dystopian kind of feel. I remember when my daughter was got um, scarlet fever. Mm -hmm. My mother was just freaked out, and she said, "In her time, there was no treatment for it. You know, it, was, and it could actually go into your heart." So, um, um, but how how does the fact that um, the livestock get antibiotics affect humans? Well, if we're feeding um, livestock antibiotics to make them grow fatter faster, there's um, you know really collateral damage um, because um, the the antimicrobial resistance that emerges in livestock um, will spill over. It will spill over to the handlers. It will spill over into the food. Um, and so, for example, these days we see more and more outbreaks of um, different you know foodborne illnesses that are associated with. Um, produce that's been contaminated with um, animal feces um, and not, you know, washed properly. And so that's led to cases of salmonella or E. coli that um, have been fatal. So um, this is, is a major problem and, and not just over there, it's a problem right here at home. The U.S. is actually one of the biggest, um, you know, culprits when it comes to misuse of antibiotics. And, and unfortunately, under the Trump administration, we went backwards and we've started using antibiotics on citrus trees um, when it, it isn't even effective. Um, and so, um, and these are medically important antibiotics that are being used, which is an important thing for your listeners to realize is that if you're using the same antibiotics in livestock or in agriculture or in our trees, whatever that you're using in humans, there's a much higher probability that you're going to confer resistance um, to the, the same organisms that are affecting human beings. Okay, so a lot of times, you know, you go to a doctor and they don't prescribe a medication. And, you know, in the old days, um, I read that doctors, you know, like William Carlos Williams, people like that, they said, if they didn't prescribe something, you was like salt and pepper or placebo, they wouldn't get paid. And is that one of the, one of the things that, you know, you go to a doctor and you know, you're, kid has a, has a sore throat and they say, you know, or you have, you know, even if someone might have pneumonia, they don't, they don't bother to do cultures anymore. They just treat it, you know, with antibiotics. Well, certainly um, in some countries, um, doctors are incentivized to provide antibiotics. And so they, they mm -hmm. get a kickback and that's one of the, you know, systemic um, and structural impediments mm -hmm. that we need to overcome. Um, and one of the other issues is that um, you know, with these broad spectrum antibiotics that were, you know, developed early on, you, you didn't need to actually culture the organism. You could just give somebody the antibiotic and most of the time it would cure the infection. So why bother? And so that kind of feeling was, um, was very pervasive. So the rapid um, diagnostics to be able to differentiate between bacterial infections and viral infections and to figure out whether resistance is a problem and which antibiotic to use those um, are, are still not widely available. There have been some 
um, techniques that have been developed, but they're, they're expensive and they're, they're not in your average hospital. So we need to improve upon that um, so that we can differentiate between you know, bacterial infections, viral infections, and then have what's called an antibiogram, which is the antibiotic susceptibility profile to be able to target which antibiotics will work. And phage therapy can actually even be synergistic with antibiotics. So um, that's another um, um, adv advantage of being able to use them in the future. And drug, and drug companies are not really spending a lot of money researching new antibiotics. That's right. The pharmaceutical industry has really gotten out of the antibiotics game, and that's because they haven't seen it as marketable. Um, what's happened is um, that, you know, an antibiotic that comes on the market um, becomes almost useless um, very quickly because of antimicrobial resistance. And most of these antibiotics are not new classes of antibiotics. They're rifts on, you know, penicillin or cephalosporin or, um, you know, streptomycin. Mm -hmm. And so um, there's, there are some uh, that are in the pipeline, but they're expensive. They take, you know, over a billion dollars, say 10 to 15 years to develop. And then you have the, say, the World Health Organization say any new antibiotics that are developed are going to be saved as last resorts. Well, that's the last thing a pharmaceutical company wants to hear. They want to hear that their drug is going to be used. So they're not making a lot of money on this in the first place. And now they hear that it's going to be used as a last resort. So they're saying, forget it. We're getting out of this game. So it, we've seen a lot of ph uh, pharmas um, go bankrupt if they've been investing heavily in antibiotics. And there's only about two or three big pharmas that are still in this space. So that's the other problem. I mean, the superbug crisis is getting worse and pharmaceutical companies are getting out of the antibiotic business. So we need to have alternatives. And phage therapy is actually being upheld as, upheld as the most promising alternative to antibiotics that are out there. Okay, um, so what can we do to, what, what can you know, we do or countries do to combat, you know, so the antibiotic resistance doesn't get worse? Well, there are things that individuals can do. I mean, we have purchasing power. When we go to the store, we can decide whether we want to eat meat. If we do eat meat, you can choose antibiotic-free meat. Um, even places like Costco these days, you have options in poultry and beef. Um, and even the pork industry is coming on board. And some of those, uh, poultry was actually one of the um, first industries to, to really see that this was important and that there was a consumer demand for antibiotic free meat. It even tastes better. So um, I only buy antibiotic free meat now and we do um, cut down on, on the amount of meat that we eat. Uh, but we also need to make policymakers aware that we're really concerned about this. Um, there is um, uh, the Pasteur Act that is before Congress right now, which is meant to improve the antibiotic pipeline and to investigate um, other antimicrobial alternatives. Um, it's really important that that gets passed urgently. And um, so that's something that I hope any of your science writers are paying attention to. That, that was an initiative under President Obama, correct? Um, I believe so, but um, it, it was actually before Congress under the Trump administration and almost passed, and now it's been revived again. So um, there's really no time to waste. Um, we're really behind, and things have gotten under, uh, worse under COVID. Why have they gotten worse under COVID? Well, um, certainly there's secondary bacterial infections that people who um, have um, been experiencing COVID who've been in the hospital, especially on ventilators for extended periods, but also antibiotic stewardship programs at hospitals that are meant really to kind of um, be really judicial about how antibiotics are used. Those really went by the wayside because it was all kind of all hands on deck, forget it. And um, we, we need to, you know, be doing whatever we can. And also antibiotics were being used even, you know, um, azithromycin with um, hydroxychloroquine being upheld as a potential treatment. So um, certainly the, that became very controversial, but in um, countries like Brazil, um, you know, azithromycin is being ha handed out in little packs um, to say here, you know, use, use this, this will help you. So when doctors feel the pressure of, you know, trying to do something and there were no treatments available very early on, they wanted to do something. So antibiotics were being used more liberally than they had been in more recent years. And so that's also contributed to the problem. And then of course, um, resources have been diverted away from the antibiotic um, situation towards COVID. And so we need to realize that 
COVID has taught us a lesson. We need to prepare for the next um, pandemic. It's already here. It's been simmering all along. My family is just one of many that have been affected by this. And, you know, um, we felt like we needed to tell our story because if I was blinded, blinded by the superbug crisis, the average person is. I mean, I'm an infectious disease epidemiologist. It was a very um, humbling and shocking experience to go through. And now we feel like my husband's um, was was really saved in this incredible way, and we want to pay it forward. Um, this um, treatment has been buried for over 100 years, and it deserves its fair shake. So um, we're advocating hard for it to get evaluated, at least in clinical trials. And if it doesn't turn out to be a game changer, then that's fine. But um, my bets on on these organisms, they have been, um, you know, battling a bacteria for 4 billion years. They're the whole reason why CRISPR exists, right? If CRISPRs are part of the bacterial immune system to fight phages. So, um, so we can use phage um, to thwart them. Um, someone asked, don't they use phage to make antibodies? Uh, well, phage have actually been used as a tool um, in um, basic science for decades. So the phage were used to discover CRISPR. Phage um, were the, the, um, the genesis of molecular biology, the fields of genetic engineering. So um, they have, have been the workhorses, but the application of phages for phage therapy to treat bacterial infections, that's the part that was really forgotten in the West. Okay. So if you're in a Russia or Poland and you go to a doctor and you have pneumonia, will they give you phage therapy before they give you if it's bacterial pneumonia, would they give you phage therapy before they give you antibiotics or a combination? Or? Well, um, in the Republic of Georgia and in Poland and in parts of the uh, other parts of the former Soviet Union, phage therapy is used very liberally. Um, you still need to match the phage to the bacteria, though. So it isn't just like any phage will, will work. Mm -hmm. um, but there are cocktails of phage that are sold over the counter. It's just that, you know, we won't necessarily know whether or not it's it's a good match for your bacteria unless you do the the, the necessary assays okay and so it's, it's sold over the counter it, yeah. it in some countries yes it is, it is sold over the counter in others it's gone it's provided through clinics okay so this is a science writing group so um you you authored the book but also with your husband and another writer could you tell us a little bit about the writing process Sure. Well, um, my husband no, and also and I, hold hold up your book because not everyone has seen. Oh, okay. Well, I'll have to grab it. <laughs> um, okay, that's okay. That's okay. Go ahead. Okay. So this is the cover. Uh, it's it's actually, I don't know that you can see that because of the. Um, maybe the not here. Yeah. Okay, so the book is The Perfect Predator, and where can you get this book? Um, it's available just about everywhere. It's on Amazon, where it's a, an editor's pick in nonfiction. This, uh, can you see this any better? Oh, geez. Hold, oh, you hold, you hold it down. Hold it down. Hold it down below your neck. There. Okay, yeah. this is the Russian version. It's Russian. been translated into Chinese, um, simple ch Chinese, uh, complex Chinese, ja Japanese, and, and Russian. Um, so you can get it on Amazon. You can go to our website, theperfectpredator.com, and there's lots of different outlets, um, your average bookstore. Um, support your local bookstores. It's important. Mm -hmm. um, so the writing process was really interesting. I mean, I never set out to write a, a book about this until um, my husband was still in the hospital and a little um, boy was being treated with phage therapy as a direct result of his case. And we both broke down and cried because we realized that this was bigger than us. It wasn't just something that, um, you know, was going to help him. It had the potential to, to help other people. And then, um, so I started to gather the information. Um, I had 52 pages of Facebook entries. I downloaded all those um, and those really acted as a journal. Um, I also got over 3000 pages of my husband's ele uh, electronic medical, medical records. And those helped me kind of 
you know, keep track of the timeline because he was in the hospital for nine months. When he came out of the hospital, he had a long recovery. We both had PTSD and we both had been beside each other for all this time, but we couldn't talk to one another. I mean, my husband was, was in a coma for a couple months. When he wasn't in a coma, he was out of his mind. His, um, you know, he often didn't know who I was. So it was a matter of getting to know each other again. And when we realized that we had gone through the same, you know, ordeal, but had different experiences, um you know this one moment where he actually had projectile black vomit hitting the wall um he thought that he was a buddha and when he opened his mouth that these beautiful little gold and silver ribbons were going all over and his, he was giving a gift as he opened his mouth and, and everyone was wandering around and picking them up i mean literally when he told me this i just laughed my head eyes are you kidding me <laughs> And so the other people were telling us like, this story is just so incredible. It reads like a movie, like you need to write this down. So um, I started to write and it, it became almost um, like a manic thing. I got, it was very cathartic. I would get up at five in the morning, write for a couple hours. My husband would get up a couple of hours later. He would tell me this, you know, the dreams, the hallucinations that were still haunting him. And I wrote those down and I used my own kind of experience with with poetry um to kind of explain them to the reader um and then you know i'd written a good chunk of the book we were able to get a top agent um gail ross who's based in dc and um i know her i know her <laughs> oh yeah she's wonderful and um her um another agent in her group uh Dara Kay, worked with us and um then so gail said you know um, you know, there, you've never written before, you know, a book. So I'm going to take this and, you know, shop it around to a couple of my trusted um, uh, publishers. And so um, the top five, you know, the big five looked at it and, and um, the comments came back were, hmm, you know, this is an illness memoir. We want more of the hot zone. And I was just going, oh, for crying out loud, like I'm about to go back to work now. And now like I got to rework this whole thing. Um, and Gail would say to me, like, Stephanie, you know, OK, he had like seven episodes of septic shock. You don't have to explain every one of those in the book. Like uh, you need to edit out a little bit like it's really hard on the reader. And I'm going really hard on the reader. What about <laughs> But then, you know, it was funny at first, but then you think about it, it's like, I wrote that first version for us, for me. And then when you're writing for the reader, what does the reader want? What does the reader want? Well, the reader does want the hot zone. The reader does want a ride. The reader wants to be educated along the way. I mean, I took um, the immortal life of Henrietta Lacks as a bit of a model, as well as the ghost map that Stephen Johnson wrote. And both of those have a bit of medical history, but they also have the personal narrative and the, and the science. And it was finding the balance between the science and um, the narrative that took the most time. And so the people who are scientists who read the book, some of them say, oh, I wish there was more science. Um, and there are some people who read the book and say, gee, there's too much science. Um, but by and large, um, you know, we've we've done well. Um, we've actually been nominated for um, some book awards and we were finalists for the Audi Awards. Um, and it's still a, a nonfiction pick on Amazon. So um, we're pretty happy. Um, and uh, the main thing for us is that the story gets out and people understand um, the superbug crisis, the potential for phage therapy. But my um, ulterior motive was really to make scientists and science accessible to people, like a real science communication exercise and, um, and to inspire young women, especially to go into science. So one of the most gratifying things is when young scientists write us and say, you know, um, we decided to go into this area because we were inspired by your book. And like, there's nothing more gratifying than that. So you're excited when they, when they made a movie called Parasite? Did you think maybe that was going to be? <laughs> <laughs> well, we have had some interest from Hollywood, of course, COVID mm -hmm. shut down the whole Hollywood enterprise. And so, mm -hmm. um, so our book is, is uh, still available for option, but um Pretty much everybody who reads it says it reads like a script. So who knows? Maybe you'll see it on the big screen someday. If anybody's a screenwriter out there, um, our film agent is Jody Hotchkiss, who lives uh, in New York, right down the street at, um, okay. at Hotchkiss and Associates. So how big is your your phage clinic? How many people are working there now? 
Oh, we only have um, a couple of full-time employees, um, but the um, infectious disease division at the University of California, San Diego, which is part of the UCSD health um, system, um, all of them um, have um, been exposed to phage therapy and are able to use it to treat patients that meet the FDA's criteria. Um, we network with other labs and um, institutes and even um, biotechs across the U.S. and um, Europe to be able to treat other patients as well. Do you think doctors are starting to get the get that they they shouldn't be prescribing antibiotics so much? Well, I think that um, de definitely um, superbugs are, and, and the antimicrobial resistance crisis is on the minds of physicians. Um, the average physician hasn't heard of phage therapy unless they're in the infectious disease um, field. Um, most of the infectious disease docs now, at least in the U.S. and Canada, have heard about it, and largely because I've been on my bandwagon along with Dr. Schooley, um, who is a very respect, respected infectious disease clinician. If it wasn't for him, um, you know, I think people would say, ah, oh, this is just an N of one, you know, but we've, we've treated a lot of other patients and we've um, documented it and published um, the case reports. Um, now we just need to move on to the trials. Okay. Um, and how are we gonna, how will the trials work? Well, the first um, trial that we're involved in is funded by the NIH, and it's part of the Antimicrobial Resistance Leadership Group, which is a network of research institutions around the U.S. that has largely been focused on new antibiotics. But since there aren't any in the pipeline, when they came to recompete for the next five years, um, they thought about phage therapy. And, and uh, Dr. Schooley was a strong advocate and is the principal investigator of the protocol that they came up with. And it was approved um, enthusiastically by the review committee and by the NIH. And so that trial will enroll cystic fibrosis patients that are stable enough that um, they are not taking antibiotics for their chronic infections. We're gonna focus on um, a superbug called Pseudomonas aeruginosa, which um, anybody who has read the book will know um, that I talk about the um, ESCAPE acronym, it's E-S-K-A-P-E. -E. Each one of those letters stands for a different superbug. And those are all superbugs that are of most serious um, um, harm to humankind. And so the P is uh, for Pseudomonas aeruginosa. My husband had Acinetobacter bomania, a little hard to pronounce, but that was the A in that lineup. So we'll be focusing on cystic fibrosis patients with chronic Pseudomonas aeruginosa infections. Um, and um, that will start at IPATH probably in early 2022, we were slowed down due to COVID and then it will roll out multi-site. And there's several other trials that are underway in, um, in other locations and the more the merrier. So when I was reading of this, I was wondering how your husband and you felt, you know, being in the medical system and not getting, you know, not, it's not helping, what's, what's out there wasn't helping you. And, you know, being, a, you know, you know, and, uh, you know, trying all kinds of treatments that didn't work. And what was that like as a, you know, as a, you know, me members of the medical community to, to find that Western medicine was, uh, was failing? Right. Well, I guess I'm, you know, I'm close enough to the medical industry, um, being an epidemiologist, but not being an MD, I really was, mm -hmm. um, you know, on the, on the outside. So um, it was, um, I really felt blindsided because I thought that the average um, infection that you pick up on vacation is going to be able to be dealt with by, you know, the arsenal of modern medicine. And I was wrong. Um, we really are in a lot of trouble. And so I get calls all the time from people who hear me speaking on, you know, NPR, we were on the Today Show, we were in People Magazine, and they say, oh, I, I heard about your story. I, my husband stepped on a nail, he's got an infection, he's about to lose his leg, is there what, what can you do to help? I mean, like, literally, these are things that you'd almost have heard about in the 1920s, and, you know, we're in 2020s, and, and, and it's back, so. We, well, one uh, thing your book calls for, shows the need for, if you're traveling abroad, have very good travel insurance, you know, travel medical insurance. That's right. My husband and I spent $36 on uh, travel insurance um, through the university. It was available when you were going on vacation um, and uh, it included medevac. And if it didn't, um, we'd be in the poorhouse for sure. Um, it took seven ambulances and two Lear jets to get him home. And so other than that, those $36, we had to pay the 
premiums for our, our health insurance that, you know, that year, but we didn't, we weren't out of pocket for anything else until he came home. Um, we needed to get a lot of nursing help. Um, and uh, I'm just very grateful that we had the resources and the help that we had. And now we want to pay it forward. We want to make sure that other people don't have to go through this. I mean, my husband, literally, if he'd had phage therapy earlier in the course of his illness, he could have walked out of the hospital, but he needed to be near death in order to get an experimental treatment like this. And yet moving forward, if we can show that phage therapy is efficacious, um, then it will be more widely available and people won't have to suffer like he did. Okay, so before you go, because I do have a question. Um, I just want to say uh, next week I'm interviewing um, Lisa Demore, who is a psychologist, specializes in children, well, actually adolescents, and she's written books about two books about teenage girls, bestsellers. She's a CBS contributing correspondent as well, and she's going to talk about mental health among adoles adolescents during COVID-19. And then on it's June 24th, on June 28th, I'm going to be speaking to Marshall Allen reporter for ProPublica, who's going to talk about, his book is called Never Pay the First Bill. And he's going to talk about how to save money on healthcare and how not to get ripped off. So, Great. well, I know some people didn't get a chance to ask their question. Feel free to email me. Um, yeah. And um, if you'd like a, an autographed copy of the book, um, I can send it to you cheaper than you can buy it, believe me. Okay, that's good to know. Um, Maybe, well, if you email me that information, I will put it on our website. Great. That makes sense. Anyway, okay. so thank you so much for spending some time with us. Thank, thank you. you. I really enjoyed reading your book. It's really reads very, very well. Like, like I said, you know, it's like a medical mystery, but it's also kind of like a thriller. And it's also like you're worrying, I wonder if this person's going to make, I wonder if your husband's going to make it, you know, because you don't, you know, you don't know the ending until you read it. So, yeah, um, well, you know his name's on the front. So I know his name's on the front, so I have a clue. And it's really a book about the how and not about the what. Yeah. Okay. Great. So, Thanks again. And, well, thank uh, you again. And, and take care, thank you everybody. For doing this. Okay, take care. May the phage be with you. Stay safe. Okay. <laughs>